Hello everyone! So excited for tonight because it's Christmas! Like, we're, we've got the Christmas story tonight. I am so excited about it. I've been really looking forward to it. I just love this story so much and I hope that you all do too. Mr. Van Star is spinning around, which usually means there's like bad news. No sound? No, th there is sound. There's this oh. little tiny sound in the background. Hmm. He says there's a little tiny sound in the background. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, whenever he gets up out of his seat, friends, that means nothing good is happening. That's what that means. <laughs> so, we'll see. Still hearing it? Maybe it's the fan. He's playing around with a bunch of stuff. So, oh, hi, everybody coming hi. in. There's... Jay Sandia, oh wow, all my friends. You guys, I get so excited to see you. Wow, look at this. Look at this, it, the gang is all here. Look at you guys. Oh yeah, oh, that's, that's why we figured it out. Mrs. Vanstar doesn't have the right mic plugged in. Hold on a second. I don't even know where the sound's coming from. It's the must be the mic from there. Let's see here. Oops. That's not right. Oops. All the adapters. You'd think after months of doing this, I wouldn't still be making um, mistakes. Okay. Let's see if this is any better. Oh, Mark C., that is such a nice compliment. And thank you, Jay San. Tessa, that's sweet. Hey, Tessa, I sent you something in the mail today. Is it using the road yet? It should be. Um, well, the other one never, he's asking me to check the mic. Neither of the other mics are showing a, um, still hear that noise. you still hear it. Um, hmm. Sorry, we're trying to work on the sound here for a second. He's playing it for me. You can probably hear it in echo. Just a little bit. Um, not really sure what to try now. Sorry. Okay. I am going to, in the middle of this live stream, oh, let me tell you before I do it. Here's the thing. I can't cut weird stuff in the beginning out and edit it because when I do, I lose the live stream. I learned that last time. So I'm going to delete the mic as a source and bring it back on and it's just going to have to be weirdness for a so second. Like you can cut out the whole start of this from the video. No, I can't. Oh, I lose can't. the live chat. That's what I just oh, said. You lose the live chat. Yeah, I lose so the live chat. Streaming. Oh, I I lose the live chat. That's what happens. Okay, so I'm going to try it. So hold on there may be silence. Okay. No. And then done. Let's see here. Um, can you hear me? We'll see if that helps. I'm 10 seconds behind you. Yeah, there's a little delay oh, too. There's a little delay. So there we go. Let me see here. I'm reading that. Yes, technical difficulties intensify. Okay, so the, that sound has gone, but the gain is very high. It's, it's the the gain, gain is high. Okay, I'll turn it down. Because I can hear some air static. I'll turn but, it but, down. That, but that thing is fixed, though. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, <laughs> Deb Coning, I was surprised. I was uh, was disappointed to find that today's story was not depressing. I'm so sorry, Michael, <laughs> to disappoint you. That's funny. Oh. Um, okay, so. Okay, you can turn it back up just a tad. Turn it back up just a tad. Okay. But you got rid of that. That's really good. Good. Okay. Yay. Sorry for technical difficulties. Do you guys know what was fun tonight? When I was doing this, I accidentally started a clip of the very first class and I was like, I'm live. And it was so crazy. So it was just so funny to see it. Okay. Yeah. I see too quiet. I turned it back up just a little bit and Mr. Van Star said it's, it's okay now. So, oh, you heard his Australian accent. Yes. It's very cool. We have very important business tonight, friends. We have a couple important things. Um, 
let me get through the first part with stuff and then I have an important question to ask you. Okay, so I turn up, people say it's a little too quiet. I turn up just a little bit. So <laughs> people saying they kept expecting something bad to happen in the story. All right, question for you, opinion question. Do you guys like funny Christmas stories or do you like these more serious ones or do you like both? Like, I really like um, a Christmas story called Auntie Claus, which is funny, but also has a little bit of a serious thing. But I'm just curious about you guys. Hello, Dracon Warrior and Kiddo39. Nice to see you. I see you guys on your mom's account tonight. Welcome, welcome. So interested to see what kind of Christmas stories you like. And if you want to throw in your favorite Christmas movie, I am here for that as well. Um, we just recently watched... Christmas Vacation, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which is very funny. So interested to see what you guys have to say about that. And I'm also interested in what you think about this story. So scale of one to five, how, five being Mrs. Van, this is my new favorite Christmas story of all time. And a one being, I can't believe, okay, so Jason's saying she can't hear me very well. Um, I turned it up again, but now I'm up where Mr. Van said it was too loud. So I don't know, we'll see. I'll get some feedback on the sound. Sorry about that. Um, so scale of one to five, scale of one to five, one being Mrs. Van, please don't ever make us read a story like this again. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Van is giving me a thumbs up, which I think he is talking about the sound, yeah, the volume. Yeah, a little higher still, I think. Oh, he says. He says, I can go even higher. Typically, friends, Mr. Van does not need me any louder than I am. So, let's see here. All right, I'm watching Funny Christmas Movie, Nightmare for Christmas. You guys, I have never seen that one. Um, oh, Home Alone, Mark C. I love them. Hey, do you guys remember when I we did the class on the heroic archetype? Well, just the other day, I got a comment on that video from a kid who said that Kevin from Home Alone fits the heroic archetype. And I was like, I think you're right. Think about, the only one I couldn't make him match was unusual circumstance of birth. But remember, hero doesn't have to have all of them. Okay, love the decimals. So Mark C, oh, Christine with a 4.892, Mark with a 3.78537747. Um, and Deb Coatney, only a three out of five. It just wasn't depressing enough. I feel like you should have got enough depression from the last story. So, oh, you prefer me to be loud so I can match your energy level? Friends, I can be so loud. Sometimes I'm speaking to groups of hundreds of people and the mic goes out, I don't even notice. So, here we go. I'm so interested. Three for the, it was fine. You'd rather read something funny. Okay, that's cool. Um. All right, thank you, stars. Let's look at some of the comments from last time. All right, so Strudel Kitty said, I told my best friend you named your room a filly, and she said she loves you. So this is Philly, the dwarf from Lord of the Rings. As I mentioned, every device, every technical device in our house is named after a character in Lord of the Rings. But guess what? Philly broke, or at least started making a very odd sound, so Mr. Vanstar had to mail Philly back to Samsung and hope they can fix it. All right, Deb Coatney, um, but is that movie black, like your black, black soul? I don't know. Okay, I think I'm going to convert you, Natasha. I think you're going to like it better than the three. Oh, elf! I have a little free library in my front yard, as you know, and I have an elf um, like little Christmas flag hanging in front of it that says, Santa's coming! I know him! All right, Simon said last time, I haven't seen Simon yet. Simon here, do you remember he had a schedule conflict, so I don't know if he's gonna be able to make it. Um, Simon said, for example, she can flip, com completely flipped me to like Your Majesty's Dragon, and I got and read all of them on audiobook. And here's something I think is funny. Do you, if you guys remember when my son Jonathan came and did a guest appearance on the um, class a couple months ago, then he heard me talk about His Majesty's Dragon, went and found my copy that I had read for this class, and then it was his birthday yesterday, and when I went on his Amazon wish list, this is what it looked like. All the, the follow-up novels. So Simon was not 
alone. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know, Deb Coatney. Simon can't make it. That's too bad. You'll have to let him know he was famous. And now you're famous, Michael, because it says, I loved this um, comment, the insight in it. The microscopic world doesn't really translate to that of the macroscopic, so I disagree with that. I love the idea that the microscopic world and the macroscopic world can be different, and I just love that you use the word macroscopic. So there you go. Jonathan is gaining points, except that he's moving tomorrow into his new house, so that is making his dad and I very sad. Yes. All right. Oh, you're only to book four. So Jonathan, I just bought him book four. That's what I just got him for his birthday. All right, Strudel Kitty said, to point out how the things that happen in nature can change the nature of human behavior. I just thought, this is of course referring to a sound of thunder that we read last time. And I just thought these insights that you guys had were so interesting. When I go over and read through the live chat, cause I miss, sometimes I miss some of the, the chat and Mr. Van Star emails it to me and I read through them. And sometimes your comments just really, I just wish we were still in class so that I could tell you how much I like them and it's so cool. Um, I just thought this was interesting and how nature can change the nature of human behavior. I think we see that in books sometimes where like people will be in a wilderness and they'll behave wildly. Um, we also see that when people are surrounded by beauty, sometimes they behave more calmly. So I just, I just thought that was an interesting insight. Um, and then Deb Coatney said, that's not an easy question to answer. And of course, Michael found this is my superpower. My superpower is to ask questions that are not easy to answer. So thank you for noticing. I appreciate that. And then this was this. I just loved these comments. Um, oh, it looks like I blocked myself out of that one. But saying, you made me love school. You did the impossible. So that was quite a um, thing. And these were comments back from a long time ago that I just want you to know, I go back and look at these. And so I just love them and I appreciate it so much. Okay. These were examples from when we were working on our little grammar last time. And I thought these were fun. Um, of course, anything with an iridescent mousse, obviously we're down for that. And yes, cookie cooking, that is a teacher's job. That is the number one job. Um, okay, so um, I loved I loved all of these. The rather disturbed turkey. I'm sure Cloudfall, we all know why that turkey was a little bit nervous. And I, I commented on this last during class, but when Strudel Kitty said the by marriages, I just really loved that. So, um, and the rotten McDonald's, I'm here for McDonald's for Thanksgiving anytime. Um, I, uh, when I read Mark C's, uh, one about what Harry had forgotten when it said he didn't have his pants, <laughs> I thought, well, what's he wearing, Mark? <laughs> he doesn't have this. So funny. Um, and then Jay Sand, I hope this was hyperbole. I hope you didn't mean this literally because this was in the comments from last time. I would die if I got a T-Rex puppet from the, the Vanstar. And I hope that's not true because this just got sent in the mail to you today. So hopefully you won't really die or all feel terrible, but there is the T-Rex puppet propped in front of one of my Christmas trees and um, it is now winging its way to you. I think it, um, it's funny because the name of my town and the name of your street were the same. All right, are you ready to dive in? Let's go. All right, first, visiting the plot. I put this in, I put the backstory in parentheses because the, it actually happens before the story opens. So, um, but I think the backstory is that this kid decides he's going to do something special for his dad for Christmas. And I think you could add to the backstory that gets revealed through the story, which is that this is a kid who lives on a farm, a family that's not very demonstrative, um, and they don't have very much money, and he wants to do something nice for Christmas. So you could expand this backstory. It grows through the course of the story. Um, the inciting incident I'm interested in what you have to say about this because I think you could make two arguments. So I'm saying the inciting incident is when he actually gets up at 2.45 in the morning to go do the things for his dad. I think that's the inciting incident. However, I think you could also make the argument that the inciting incident is when he decides he's going to. 
Now, the reason I didn't choose that as the inciting incident is because lots of times people decide to do things and then they don't really follow through with them. And so to me, the inciting incident is when he actually gets up and does it. But if you guys want to disagree with me about that, then you can, I'm happy to hear that. Um, and then the rising action is he goes to the barn, he does all the chores. Interestingly, this is super short. I mean, this, this story overall is short, but this part, the rising action of how he goes to the barn and does all the chores, it's like a paragraph. And the climax of the story is when the dad comes to wake him up. And when we get deeper into it, you're going to see it's like a single short line. And Jason, if you're always awake at 2.45, yeah, you probably do need to milk more cow. <laughs> Although Michael says no. Um, and then the falling action is dad, you know, he, he realizes that the chores are done and they celebrate Christmas and these memories, it's like really, um, a, like a gentle, a gentle wrap up at the end. Now, interestingly, um, at the risk of making Michael mad at me, um, there is a slightly longer ver version of the story. So what you guys read, if you read the printed version, that has everything in it. If you listened to me read it, that cut out a paragraph. The new version that was printed, this one that I read in the video um, that Mark Boehner did, um, he left out the last paragraph about the guy's wife. It didn't really fit in with the story. So if you listened to that, you didn't hear it, but we're not going to discuss it. Um, so there you go. All right. So, okay. So Cloudfall's saying... Um, that when he makes the decision, interesting. I know, sorry, Michael. It's not, it's in like the, if you read the printed one, it's there, but it's just only a, another paragraph. So I think you can handle it. All right, who wants to push back against me? I saw one already, Cloudfall saying that it was when he decided to wake up. Anybody, anybody else wanna disagree with me about that? Um, so I'm, I'm interested in that. So this is a quote from um, St. Thomas Aquinas, and I feel like this quote captures the whole essence of the theme of this story. So, um, okay, let me see here. Mark C says, I think the resolution would be him deciding something nice for his wife. Yeah, yeah, you could if you were doing that version. Yeah, that's true. Yes, you did get the whole story, Michael. You can, you can relax. <laughs> Okay, so this Thomas Aquinas quote, I just absolutely love it. For joy is caused by love. So joy is caused by love. We feel joy when we feel love. And then he says two, two ways that we feel love. Either through the presence of the thing loved. Like we feel joy because the thing we love is there. Or because the proper good of the thing loved exists and endures in it. Meaning that even if the thing isn't with us, the thing that we love, we know is there either in a memory or um, or it's not with us, but we know that it's fine and somewhere else. It's just such a pretty idea to me. I, I, I like this idea, like that we feel joy when either the thing that we love, um, when that thing we love is either with us or we know that it's safe. So I just saw Jay Sands comment about the room that I was in when I recorded the story. That is my living room. So if you guys ever come to visit the Van Star household, you will, I'm sure, go in that room. Um, let's see, when he realized his dad loved him, could that count as the inciting incident? Oh, ooh, Christine, Christine. Mm, you know what? I think you're right. I, I think you're right. I'm changing my opinion. I'm changing my opinion. Christine, I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay. So we're going to read this story at the risk of offending Michael, who wants to read everything through the lens of justice. We're going to read this story through the lens of joy. So, and yes, Jason, that's my living room. I, it looks more fancy than it is. It really it has a Barbie dream house in it. <laughs> we have a two-year-old granddaughter, so it's not that fancy in real life. It looks more fancy because the Christmas tree's up. Um, we're going to read the story through the theme of joy, the way that this family finds joy and how we can find joy. 
So it starts out when he's an older man, right? Strange how the habits of youth clung to him still. And this is, this is a Mrs. Van-ism that small word choices and syntax changes make a big difference. Because look at this. This is the line in the story as written by Pearl Buck. Strange how the habits of youth clung to him still. Look at this one shift. Strange how the habits of youth still clung to him. See the difference in how that feels? This is how it was written, how the habits of youth clung to him still. And then this is the more typical way to say it. Strange how the habits of youth still clung to him. Do you see the difference in feeling? How it feels so much more sophisticated this way? How it has a more formal feel. So when you're writing, you can do that. And when you're reading, you should notice it. Because small word choices and syntax changes make a big difference. Mrs. Vanism. Yes, new hashtag. All right. So he said some of the habits of youth clung to him still. I want to know what are some of the habits that you have now that you think might cling to you? Things that you might do for decades to come. So curious here. All right, so he slipped back in time. And now what we've got is what we call in literature a flashback. So a flashback is a specific structural choice that an author will make. So flashbacks are when the narrative story goes back in time from the current point of the story. And that can happen at any point in the narrative. You can have, my husband and I just finished watching The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, and they were doing flashbacks in the very last episode from stuff that happened before the story really started. So it's kind of interesting. Um, Deb Coney waking up too early, apologizing for everything, playing video again. Too, too easily forgive. Nice. So I, I love reading these habits you think are going to um, stay with you. So you can get a flashback at any time. The big English teacher word for flashback is analepsis. And pro tip, your English teacher won't even tell you this one probably, even if you're in AP English, they probably won't use this term, is prolepsis. So prolepsis is when something is like um, foretold like a prophecy would be a prolepsis. So analepsis is like saying what happened before the current time of the story and prolepsis is like what's going to happen. Ooh, look at that, that was like way close. Sorry about that. Um, and then, yes, always reading a book before bed, sleeping in, yeah, that's funny. All right, so that's what you need to know about flashbacks. You guys probably knew the first one, right? You know what that means. But here's something kind of interesting is that flashbacks serve different roles. And so when an author uses flashback, it's important for you guys as the readers to look and see, like ask your magic eight ball, why is the author using this flashback? Concentrate and ask again, right? Okay, so you want to, um, you want to look closely, look closely at it and see, is the author doing this to aid character development? Are they doing it to break up the chronology? Sometimes they do it to prevent things from being boring. Like rather than having some super long story arc that's all happening at the same time, they'll interrupt it. Like we pause this regularly scheduled programming to bring you something slightly more interesting. Sometimes it will give you deeper insight. Like you don't even know why the character is doing this. And so they give you a flashback so that it makes the character a little bit more sympathetic. Like, oh, okay, now I understand why the guy's a jerk, right? Sometimes it explains the conflict, like why do these people hate each other? And then sometimes they do it to remind the reader of what has come before. So it's like, you might have forgotten this, so now we're gonna remind you. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Let's look at some examples of these. Okay, yes, hopefully watching the videos. You want these binoculars? I know, they're pretty cute, aren't they? Okay, ooh, that reminds me, I have something. But let's look at some examples of flashback. All right, in Harry Potter, there's a ton of flashback. And, and Rowling does something interesting, which is that she has the pensieve that is actually a flashback machine, essentially. So that's kind of, what does simp mean? I don't know, is that for me? No, okay. I'm like, did I say simp? No, it's in the chat. All right, so the pensieve is a, um, is a flashback device. 
have you guys seen this movie, Ratatouille? And in Ratatouille, it's like the taste of this thing sends them back in time. So sometimes you can have like a smell or a taste or a sight of something and it will send the character back to some memory that happened before. In Twilight, there is a lot of flashback. They do this whole montage of black and white kind of film noir. Um, so I wanna know, can you guys think of one? Can you think of an incident, a flashback in a book or a movie that you have read? So see if you can tell me one that I didn't already say. Now, this particular story is an even more narrow form of flashback. It's called a frame story, where there's like this broader frame, like it's a story within a story. So really this is a story about a grown man 30 years after his father's died, rem his, after his father has died, remembering something that happened. And then that story of what actually happened is a story within a story, almost like those Russian nesting dolls. So that that is what we have here, is the frame story. And we have already read a frame story. I don't know if you guys wanna take a guess. I'm gonna give you a second to guess. While you're guessing on what frame story we've already read, I wanna ask your opinion. I mentioned this when we um, first started tonight, that we had something we needed, I needed you guys to do today. Um, in my regular classroom, like in person with people who are alive in, in 3D, I have a mascot for the class. So Mrs. Um, Van Star's mascot is this. This is Chip. He is a naked mole rat. Um, and I love naked mole rats. Oh, I'm looking at their clown falsing in Star Wars Rebels when the protagonist goes into the world between the worlds. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool. The Mandalorian has it. I'm looking at all of your different ideas about um, your different flashbacks. Not the lottery, nope. We've read a frame story. I, I can't wait to see if anybody can guess it. Okay, so this is the, this is the mascot for my in-person class. What I need to know, I think we need a mascot. And what I don't know is, should we use the same mascot? Like, should Chip be our mascot? Chip the naked mole rat, should this be our mascot? Or should we get a different mascot? And if you think that we need a different mascot, then I need some suggestions. So you could throw out suggestions for a mascot. Okay, the answer to the frame story we've already read is the bet. We've already read the frame story, the bet, where he's looking back and telling the story of something that had happened years earlier. Hadn't happened to him, but there we go. All right, so it says, he loved his father. And this is a deceptively short sentence that the character says. And it's interesting because it's critically important, but it's super short. And this author actually does this twice. Now, right here, was it Cloudfall? Who, who was it who said that this, was, that this was the inciting incident? Who was that? Christine. I think it was Christine. Totally, totally, I'm on board with that now. All character development hinges on this idea that he realizes that he loves his father. And the reason that the character development hinges on this is because it, it changes him. And because it changes him, he's a dynamic character instead of a static character. Ooh, a dragon. A dragon as the mascot. It's okay. What? Serignus. Serignus. Serignus the dragon. I'll have to order another one. I'll have to order another one. Okay, yeah, good idea, good idea. All right, so this is um, the dad says, Mary, I hate to call Rob in the mornings. And then the mom says, yeah, but the chores have to be done. And, she, and he says, yeah, but I sure do hate to wake him. And Rob overheard this. Now, it ended well, but my question for you is, um, does overhearing things always end well? Like it ended well here for him, but do you think it always ends well? What else can happen if you overhear something that wasn't really intended for your ears? There you go. And then here, this big important moment, when he heard these words, something in him spoke, his father loved him. Boom. Yes, his father loved him. You're so right about this. How did I miss this as an inciting incident? Mm, you guys are amazing. 
Okay. Um, and, and then this was an interesting, a couple of lines, I thought. Curious about what you guys think about this. He had never thought of that before, taking for granted the tie of their blood. Neither his father nor his mother talked about loving their children. They had no time for such things. There was always so much to do on the farm. Uh, are we buying this? Like, I'm curious. Are you guys buying this? Like, do we buy that you can be so busy that you don't have time to say to your kid, love ya, right? Like, how long does it take exactly? And do you think it's possible that he means something else besides literally that they never had any, that they didn't really talk about that. Like, do you think this is possibly a reference to like not literal time, but maybe mental energy? I'm not sure. It's kind of interesting. So curious about this. Yeah. Cloudfall saying, uh, overhearing things rarely ends well. You could hear something life changing. You were never supposed to hear. Yeah. Okay, so we're buying it. Some of you buying it. Some think it's realistic. I, I don't know. Um, note, the lack of demonstrated love in the family is the only conflict in the story that I could find. I couldn't find any other conflict in the story. So if you guys can think of any other conflict in the story, I would be curious. Um, yeah, I think you're right, Cloudfall, that in a sense, sometimes the busy, hardworking, focused parents aren't also the, oh, I love you. Yeah, so... Yeah, true. Um, all right. Delta is a mathematical symbol for change. And here's the delta. This is where the character changes. Now that he knew his father loved him, there would be no loitering in the mornings and having to be called again. He got up after that, stumbling blindly in his sleep but and pulled on his clothes, his eyes shut, but he got up. And that is how we know this character has changed. This is not a static character. This is a dynamic character. He has made a big change and he made that change. Um, because of his dad. Um, and then I just, yeah, maybe it just wasn't the norm. Yeah, Christine, I think that's right. Um, so that year when he was 15, and then later she says that Christmas when he was 15, uh, if you guys remember that. And that struck me, that, that, that repeat of that phrase. And so I wanted to focus on that just a little bit. Here's another Mrs. Vanism. If the author repeats a phrase, always ask yourself why. Like, what is it that the author is trying to accomplish for this? Again, handy dandy magic eight ball. Why would Pearl S. Buck use that phrase, that Christmas when he was 15, that year he was 15? And my reply is no. So the magic eight ball won't tell me. I just have to think of it myself. All right, so we're gonna revisit the a positive phrase. We read, we looked at a positive phrases before when we did Desiree's baby, if you guys remember that. Um, when we did Desiree's baby, we did that. So, an A positive phrase. Group of words that follow a noun and give more precise information about it. So they're made up of an article like a uh, or an or the, and they can also include other kinds of things, and they're set off by commas. So, here are some examples. Mrs. Van, the teacher who loved the hashtag tags, hope Cookie Cookie would be in class. Mr. Van, that handy IT husband, man the live chat during class. Mrs. Van, that teacher who's on Wikipedia, absolutely loves live stream with advanced stars. True story, you guys, this week, Wikipedia article went up. That was kind of crazy. So these are A positives, right? They're giving more information about the main thing. So it's saying like, when he did this that year, that year he turned 15, reminding us of that year. So why do authors use A positive phrases? They use A positive phrases to highlight a trait. They will do it to clarify who you're talking about, um, they sometimes do it to manipulate the reader, and they also do it to give more information. In this case, I think Buck is doing it to, um, in a non-mean way, uh, manipulate the reader a little bit. She's trying to create a feeling to emphasize what's going on. So I want you guys to try it. Let's see. Okay, the Friday night before Christmas that year and I want an A-positive phrase that describes the year. So here we had that year he turned 15. Um, and then I want something that she finally did. Insert a cool thing. So, and then the Friday night before Christmas, that year, blah, 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 that year what? She finally what? So come up with something cool that year. So, want to see this. Um, yes, there is the Dan Star website too. I want to see what you guys come up with. So let me go back just one second that 
those, I just want you to see these examples again. So the year, so we had this one, that year when he was 15 or that Christmas when he was 15. Here you have a couple of examples. Um, Mrs. Van, the teacher who loved the hashtags, Mr. Van, that handy IT husband. So give me um, an A positive to tell me about this year. That year such and such, right? That year such and such, and she finally does what? I cannot wait to see these. All right, so I can't wait to see them. I haven't seen them yet. Now I'm already telling you, nice job. All right, they were poor, and most of the excitement was in the turkey they had raised themselves and in the mince pies his mother had made. He wished that Christmas when he was 15, he had a better present for his father. Oh, here are some of them are coming in. And then the Friday night before Christmas, that year she met her online friends, she finally felt complete. Oh, that's so sweet. The Friday night before Christmas, that year that COVID overtook the world, she finally, is <laughs> crazy around away. That year she was finally able to put her anxiety to rest. Oh, that's beautiful. The year she first went to Mrs. Van Star's classes, she finally realized, these are so fun. That year during which it rained food. I know, who knew that quarantine could be so delicious? Mr. Van Star and I say that all the time. That year it finally snowed. Oh, cool. Oh, these guys are so fun. You you guys are the best. You are the best. Yeah, I just think you're so awesome. That Friday night before Christmas, the year the earth exploded. I know. Oh, um, my daughter-in-law sent me a little thing today. And in um, that, you know how like um, our, uh, oh, I just forgot it. I was going to tell you something funny she sent. Anyway, it went along with what you said. If I think about it, I'll come by. Okay, here's another thing that changes. The tie. It had seemed nice enough, right? But now it no longer is. He's changed, and so now this gift is no longer reflective of who he is as a person, right? And so that represents the change. It's really important. And his dad, when he asks his dad what's a stable, it's just a barn like ours, and that's where he gets the idea. The thought struck him like a silver dagger. Friends, this is the only... Um, this is the only figurative language in the entire story. Most of the story is written in very straightforward, plain language. Um, the year she tamed the dragon. Uh, and it says, the thought struck him like a silver dagger. So I went and tried to look it up, like are silver daggers a thing? And it turns out that they are in like some video game, but in real life, they're not. Because silver, you can't get a super sharp blade on it. Um, steel makes a way better blade than silver and because silver melts at hot temperatures so they can't fire it enough to get a sharp blade. So I'm wondering why do we think that they use this? But we see this is that whale of a word simile. Simile is similar, right? So metaphor, we're saying this thing is this thing. Simile, we're saying it's like the thing. It's similar to the thing. So the thought was like a silver dagger, kind of curious. Um, silver dagger is an interesting idea. I wanna see what you guys come up with. The thought struck him like a something else. Give me something else. The thought struck him like a, I wanna know. Cause I'm not 100% sold on silver dagger. You guys tell me, I'm not 100% sold on Silver Dare. I mean, I get the idea she's trying to say it was like like super sharp and like a stabbing thought, but uh, I don't know. Oh man, Jay Sand, lottery reference, woo, throwing it down. There we go. All right, I wanna see some of those. I wanna see, give me some of these similes. The thought struck him like a dead fish. That's not good. Give me something, dead fish. Give me something like where you get like this burst of thought, right? Like, bam, a thought. Okay. Struck him like a cow from heaven. Okay. Bolt of lightning, a little cliche. Give me more. Give me more. Like a shard of glass from the shattered mirror of the past. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, steel dagger. Oh, nice one, Dogoni. Struck him like an old lady's purse. <laughs> okay. You guys are awesome. You're the best. You're just the best. I'm the luckiest English teacher in the history of the world. All right. So here was his thought. He would get up early, and then when his father went in to start the milking, he'd see it was all done, and he would know who had done it. Why is it important to Rob that his dad knows who did Oh, of course, the thought had to strike him like an iridescent moose. Of course, of course. All right, why is it important that his dad knows he did it? Why do you think that's important? 
Okay, so he goes out there. It says he had never milked alone before, but it seemed almost easy. The task went more easily than he'd ever known it to go before. Milking for once was not a chore. It was something else. A gift to his father who loved him. It's so interesting because his attitude changed. The task did not change. It wasn't actually easier to milk the cows, but it felt easier because his attitude changed. So it turns out your mom was right all along. Your attitude does make a huge, huge, huge difference. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Seb Coney, if you were struck by a dead fish, you would experience a flood of emotion. That's absolutely true. <laughs> That's absolutely true. All right, so this, this idea that meaning shapes experience is very, very powerful, and it can really change your life. And I'm curious about when you guys have felt this before. When have you had something that you were like used to doing, you maybe never even really thought about it, or it seemed like a chore, all of a sudden it's infused with some other meaning, and all of a sudden it changes how it feels to you. You know, I can give you an example. I can give you an example from some of you guys, is that like you're coming to an English class on a Friday night, Right. And now it's like a fun thing that we all look forward to. But like teachers work like it's work for them and students have to be made to go to school sometimes. And so we we've had this meaning change because we've grown a community. Right. So that's one example. But I'm curious about what other times you guys have had that in your life where something the meaning has changed and it's changed the experience for you. It was infused with joy. Is infused with joy. Well, Jonathan, before you go, come on over and say hi to the dance stars. <laughs> Here's Jonathan. Hello. He's he's uh, running out to Home Depot to get some extra keys for his house. So. Yeah. So, oh, well, wait. Tell them what you thought about His Majesty's Dragon real quick. Just, like, squat down. Mm -hmm. You've read the first three. If they've read the first one, what advice would you have for anybody considering reading the others? Other two. The others... The story slows down a bit, I'd say. Um, not quite the same level of energy going through. I don't know if my hand is... Yeah, there we go. Uh -huh. Not quite the same level of energy going through, but I still enjoyed it enough that I'm going to try and basically read them all. Okay. So the plot slows down, but the characters are still intriguing? Yeah, yeah, overall. And the plot doesn't slow down so much that you've lost interest? Yeah, I can agree with that, yeah. Okay. All right, we'll go get your keys. Everybody says hi. They're calling you Van Spawn. <laughs> That's awesome. Wait, somebody's talking about D and D. Yeah, I mean, I I do DM a small campaign. Yeah, he does. He does. He's a big Dungeons and Dragons guy. Yeah. All right, you guys. All right, we'll see you. Have a have a a uh, good time, Jonathan. All right, the door opened, and this is the climax, right? So we, it's interesting because we had that super short sentence earlier, his father loved him, big moment. And now we have the door opened, big moment, a three word sentence, a four word sentence, but a big, big, big moment. So awesome. Um, his father was laughing, a queer sobbing sort of laugh. Now, now queer we associate with like LGBT, but um, in the past, queer has meant like funny, like odd. Oh, that's a queer smell or a queer sense of humor or something like that, right? We know that feeling, don't we? Don't we know that feeling where you're like laughing but almost crying and it's almost a hiccup laugh? It's like so amazing. Um, so kind of cool. It's joy. That's that feeling of joy where you're so happy. It's just like bubbling out of you and you don't even really... Um, do it. I, I I don't know. You just don't even, you can't really contain it. Another Mrs. Vanism. Literature gives us shared experience, cautionary experience, and aspirational experience. Meaning, what I mean by that is when you read, you either feel connected to what happens in the story, like you recognize yourself in it, or it gives you a cautionary experience. Like, be careful about this. You like learn from this character. Don't make the same mistakes as this character. And then it can also give you aspirational experience, which is like, that's how I want my family to be, or that's how I want my life to be. So whenever you read, consider what kind of experience is this giving me? Is this giving me a shared experience? Am I relating to this character? Is it giving me a cautionary experience? Is, my, is it warning me against something? Or is it giving me an aspirational experience? Is it, is it showing me a way that I would like to be? And I think for me, this book gives 
in some ways both a shared and aspirational experience. I can remember giving gifts like that or at least hoping that I was. And I also want to make sure I am doing that. Um, he found his father and clutched him in a great hug. His heart was bursting with love. So it's just very subtle figurative language that the heart was bursting with love. The heart, his heart isn't literally bursting, right? And we know that the heart isn't necessarily really the seat of love, but it is some mild figurative language to let us know how he feels. Um, oh, what a Christmas and how his heart had nearly burst again. I just love that line, oh, what a Christmas. That's that joy again. We just keep seeing it over and over, these little moments of joy. Oh, what a Christmas, and his father loved him, and the hug of his dad, it just comes up again and again and again. The best, so his dad says, it was the best Christmas gift I ever had, and I'll remember it, son, every year on Christmas morning, so long as I live. Just saying it gives me chills. You guys, if you watch the recording of me reading this story, at this part of it, I was trying so hard not to cry because it always makes me cry every time I read this story. Can you think of a memory that you have right now that you feel like you will remember for the rest of your life? That you think, I will never forget this as long as I live. Um, one of the things that's interesting um, is that there are certain things that you will remember all your life and they aren't necessarily even that important. What's really interesting is when you are in a moment and you recognize it in the moment, like you realize in the moment, this is gonna be an amazing memory. This is gonna be an amazing memory. And so I just, yes, it made me cry too. Yeah, <laughs> it made me cry too. That's funny, Van Spawn and Van Spawns. Oh, we got the more hashtags. So. I'm just curious about memories that you know right now that you think climbing onto a bookshelf when you were three. Wow. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to see some of these come in. And he says they had both remembered it. And now that his father was dead, he remembered it alone. That blessed Christmas dawn when alone with the cows in the barn, he had made his first gift of true love. I, I just love this so much. I think this is the sweetest moment. Um, and I think it's interesting because this moment brings him joy even though it's tinged with sadness. I think a lot of times joy is tinged with sadness and this is one of the ways that, that we have stories that are shared experience. I'm loving reading these memories. You were carried around for 30 minutes for a challenge and all the teachers just disappeared. Um, <laughs> And then middle school science fairs. Oh, wow. These memories. So what made this a gift of true love? What what made it a gift of true love? What, what made, I mean, it was a chore. So he went and did some chores. Why is this a gift of true love? And I'm curious, have you ever given a gift of true love? Or has anyone ever given you a true gift of love? So I'm very curious about that. Um, given a true gift of love. I remember I can, uh, one of them that springs to mind that I've been given is that a couple of years ago on Mother's Day, one of my sons gave me this beautiful carved box that was like a willow tree angel box, which I like those. And, um, and it had little notes in it and he had hidden notes all over the house. And I was finding them for like a year, little folded up pieces of notebook paper where he had written like, thank you for this or thank you for that. It was so cool. Your parents have a book business, Deb Coatney? Why am I just now finding out about this? Um, yeah. It was a true gift of love, Cookie Cookie says, because he didn't have to do it early, but he chose to do it because he wanted to be good. I love that. Christmas is the greatest gift of true love. Well, that's a beautiful insight, Kira Shepherd. Um, I'm getting like um, memories and answers to this question coming through at the same time. Falling through a hole in the barn's floor about eight feet. Whoa. Make fade, made fake Cheez-Its for your birthday. That's so cool. It is. Okay, so there's something interesting there. Your Ukrainian sister, Natasha, Jonathan, my son who was just here, he lived in Eastern Ukraine for two years. He speaks Russian, actually. 
Um, he did it out of the goodness of his heart. Yay. Yeah. I think I, I'm honest I, where Deb Coatney said that, like, um, like it's, it's when they spend a lot of time, there's a role in, in that first sac of sacrifice, right? Um, so back to the Thomas Aquinas quote for joy is caused by love, either through the presence of the thing loved or because the proper good of the thing loved exists and endures in it. And the reason I think that this applies to this story is because when the, in the inside story, inside the frame, his dad was alive, but at the end and at the beginning in the frame, um, the dad has passed away. So he's, he isn't, he's not present anymore, but the proper good of the thing love does exist and endure. And I love that idea. Um, I just absolutely love that idea that we, we can have these memories and that they will bring us joy, that they will bring us joy. So clay cheese its molded perfectly and painted. So do you like trick people with them or do you like just like them? Yeah, that is way cool. Um, Deb Coney, I think I'm going to need photographic evidence of these that you need to send me. So yeah, um, that would be good. All right, let's put this story in a little bit of context. So this story, Christmas Day in the Morning, was written by Pearl S. Buck and published in 1955 in this issue of Collier's Magazine. And this is what it looked like in 1955. This is what the magazine spread looked like. You can see the illustration of Rob going out to the barn. Um, and I just love this ad with Santa and his Coke. I totally would love a, that picture hanging in my house. But this is what it looked like in 1955. So Collier's was a magazine that was like, not a house magazine, like not like Southern Living or something like that. More like... Um, what we have now, like the New Yorker or the, or the Atlantic or Vanity Fair or something like that. But the, but Pearl S. Buck published a number of Christmas stories. I found pictures of these two family circle magazines where they both featured stories by her. And if you see the one on the right, it, um, Walt Disney Studios actually illustrated the story. So it was a thing it was a thing that fiction would be in magazines. People used to read fiction a lot more in magazines, like Family Circle, right? Family Circle doesn't really have fiction anymore. It has like recipes and style and health and stuff like that, health and wellness. But it used to be full of fiction and, and lots and lots of people got the magazines and lots and lots of people read them. Pearl S. Buck ended up taking a bunch of her Christmas stories and turning them into a collection you can still buy on, on Amazon now, like you can buy it at any bookstore. But, um, but this particular story, Christmas Day in the Morning, was not included in that story collection, which I think she called Once Upon a Christmas. So this is Pearl S. Buck. Pearl S. Buck is really an interesting person. She was the child of missionaries from the United States, so they were American, but they were serving in China. And she was born in the United States, but moved to China when she was like three months old. And she lived in China almost her whole life until she was 40 years old. She went back to the United States to go to college. Um, she wrote a novel called The Good Earth that won the Pulitzer Prize. And she won the Nobel Prize for Literature for that novel as well. She was the first American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So it's pretty cool. <gasps> Simon's here. Simon, hello. Oh, so excited to see you. Um, and so this story that she wrote here is not like a lot of her other stories. A lot of her other stories deal with life in China. And she part of what she's best known for is bridging that cultural gap between Asian and Western culture. If you get it, it like if you feel like being a little adventurous in your reading. I highly recommend reading The Good Earth. Um, it, is, it is one of those stories that like really sticks with you. And it's something that you will hear alluded to a lot, partly because of who Pearl S. Buck was. She had an interesting story herself. She had one child 
who had a condition that called PKU that she didn't metabolize nutrients correctly. They can treat it better now, but her daughter was permanently very severely mentally disabled. And she ended up adopting other children, but she had a lot of difficulties in her life. Um, during the Chinese Revolution, she was in real danger. Um, she's a very interesting person. Anyway, if you're looking for reading, then you will want to take a look at those. So I have this question to ask you. Today is the first full day of Hanukkah. Tonight is the second night of Hanukkah. And I'm not everybody celebrates Christmas, right? So my question for you is, what's the value of these kinds of stories for people who don't celebrate Christmas, right? Like, so if you don't celebrate Christmas, let's say you're Jewish, you celebrate Hanukkah or you're, you're Hindu, you celebrate a different holiday or you're Muslim and you celebrate like Ramadan and Eid or whatever, right? Whatever you celebrate, what is the value of, of these kinds of stories if you do not celebrate Christmas? So I'm going to wait for some answers to come in here. And in the meantime, I want to share something. So I want to send you, um, if you want one, I have made a special little Van Star bookmark for a small Christmas present. So I have these Van Star bookmarks that I would like to send to people. And if you would like one, please just put your, um, I'm, my husband is gonna put, Mr. Van Star is going to put um, my email address in the chat. Send me your physical mailing address and I will mail you one in the real mail. These are real actual um, actual bookmarks. So if you would like a Van Star bookmark, then send um, me, email me your street address and I will mail them to you. So I just see that Mr. Van Star put the email address in. So I will mail you one in the real mail. All right. And then please, so you've got my email address now. Just shoot me an email with your street address and I will mail you the bookmark. Um, okay. And then if you would, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. What is the value of these kinds of stories for people who don't celebrate Christmas? And yes, Jay Sant, I have your address. So that's good. Yep, email a street address for the bookmark. So what's the value? If I'm, if I'm Jewish or atheist or Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist or a Jain or any religion, um, what is the value of this kind of story? Is there value in that? I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, let's see. Most everyone recognizes the importance of joy, giving, love, which are often shown in Christmas stories. I think you're right. Those are like universal ideas, aren't they, Christine? Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I'm looking for other thoughts as well. While they come in, while they come in, I will share that our next class will be a short story. I don't have quite enough votes on a novel yet. So um, I don't have enough votes on the novel. I had this one, I had to take it off. Anyway, long story. We're gonna read another short story, January 15th. Hopefully then um, we'll have a novel ready. Um, celebrating the winter solstice. Yeah, I mean, recognizing change, interesting concept of love and family. That's nice. The spirit of the season can be appreciated no matter the religion and the person experiencing it. Totally agree with you. So if you haven't read Flowers for Algernon, I think you are in for a treat. I think it will be dark enough even for Deb Cotney. Um, and that you don't like Flowers for Algernon? It's not a book. It's just a short story. The ending is so sad. I thought that was dark enough for you, Deb Cotney. Um, I don't have a... I have a... Yeah, the voting. Hmm sign up make sure you sign up go make sure you go to the gifted guru page and put in go to the short story class make sure that you sign if you just go to giftedguru.com click on english class you will sign up sign up for the email list i'll send out the voting so i can get more votes i know it's dark i want it you were complaining earlier that the story wasn't dark enough you can't have it both ways 
it is quite depressing, but I want to look at it through a different lens maybe than you've explored it in the past. So I'm really looking forward to it. I also feel like it's one that, no, it's not, it's a, it's a short story. Um, let me see how long it is. Length of Flowers for Algernon. Oh, whoa, never mind. I'm going to have to change it. You're right. It's a full-on book. I think of it as a, I think of it as a short story, but it's not. It has 224 pages. Too long. Abort, abort, abort. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So we're going to have to do, okay. We're going to have to make a change. Uh, okay. What I said before, go sign up for the email list has just become even more important because I will have to make a shift. Let me think here. Um, oh, you know what? I just made, I, I can do it. What we're going to do is, um, I, I'm changing the um, story right now. I'm gonna type the name of it in here. Um, we'll, we'll do the most dangerous game instead of Flowers for Algernon. I don't know why I thought it was a short story. I guess it, I guess I just read it fast. It is a short story. It's a short story and a novel. That's why. It's a short story and a novel. I'll still shift because otherwise I'll hear a lot of complaints about how we didn't read the long one. We'll do Most Dangerous Game. So Most Dangerous Game, January 15th. Again, sign up. So you've got a couple things to do. Um, you Make sure you sign up for the email list. Go to giftedguru.com. Click on English class. You'll find the sign up. And then... Secondly, make sure that you email me your address if you want me to um, send you a bookmark. Let me move backwards off of this because I'm showing you like the wrong thing. Oh, oh, good. Janet Perry says um, the most dangerous game is awesome. Good. I'm glad you like it. Okay. So we didn't get that many. Yeah, we got some responses to this. They were good. Most Dangerous Game. Um, most Dangerous Game. Most Dangerous Game is definitely a, um, a short story. They have made a movie out of it. It's written by a guy named Richard Connell. Um, Richard Connell. Oh, you want to do it anyway? Okay, he wants to do it anyway. Well, it's a short story or a novel. You guys want to do this and read Most Dangerous Game after? I'll let you vote. Throw it in there, what you want to do. Flowers for Algernon or Most Dangerous Game. We can do Most Dangerous Game the next time um, if we don't do it next time. I'll let you vote. I'm watching. Vote now. And then, so I'll let you vote here for a minute or so. And then we will end the class for tonight. I'll be looking forward to getting your addresses so I can send you bookmarks. And um, this is super fun. Do it anyway. Okay. Okay, we're doing it. You watched the movie and it was different from the, oh, you watched the movie of Most Dangerous Game or this one? Okay, William wants Most Dangerous Game. Jay Sand, which one are you saying? No, no, no. Most Dangerous Game sounds better. Now you want to do it. You want to do what now? Flowers for Algernon, Flowers for Either is great. Most Dangerous Game severely like Flowers for Algernon. Either way, you're happy. Flowers for Algernon. Whatever. Natasha. Well, you're making it really hard because I think we've got about a 50-50 split. We've got about a 50-50 split. Hold on a second. I'm looking to see if I have a coin in my desk. Okay. I'm going to do them both in one class. No, not one class. Two classes. Okay. Um, okay. We can do them both. Two classes. Not one class. Two classes. Yeah. Jay Sand, if you've already read Flowers for Algernon, I won't make you read it again. Um, but I think you may get something out of the discussion at least. So this is what we'll do. We'll do Flowers for Algernon next time, and then we'll do Most Dangerous Game, and then maybe by March we will have figured out a novel. So, okay. So we're gonna do, it's too flippant to flip for it. I couldn't flip because my coin was too big. Um, we'll do Flowers for Algernon first, just in case somebody watches the live stream is like it says. So we'll do Flowers for Algernon in January. Nice, depressing way to start the new year. And then we'll do Most Dangerous Game 
We may do Most Dangerous Game in March. I might do something special for Valentine's Day, but we will do Most Dangerous Game. It's really good. Okay. Um, I'm sorry you don't like it. Maybe I can persuade you. You know I have that superpower. All right, you guys. I want to wish you the merriest of Christmases, the happiest of Hanukkahs, the coldest and darkest of winter solstices. Whatever you celebrate at this time of year, I wish you the happiest and best of it. I want to tell you that this year you have been the greatest gift I could ever have had. I feel so badly for all the people who have had a really rough year this year because this group, you guys, have made it one of the best years of my life because you have been so, so, so amazing. You are a gift to me. I think about you every day. And I'm very, very grateful to you. You, you have been a, a true gift to me. So thank you so much. And I will look forward to seeing you guys on January 15th. And I'll be looking forward to getting a bunch of email from you. So um, I will be signing off now. And until next time, when we will be back January 15th, same bat time, same bat channel to um, do another short story, Flowers of Algernon, that we almost aborted, but now we're doing, even though Jay Sand is very, very sad, but I'll have to make it up to her. All right, you guys, until